Fuck. Okay. So, hey, welcome everybody. We're back here with Robinson Activities and Athletics, and uh, we are so fortunate to, today to uh, have two-time Olympian and Olympic silver medalist Lucas Kaczynski, who uh, has just returned back to his home in Colorado Springs, Colorado, the Olympic Training Center, where heck, maybe we can uh, we can see a 2024 as well. But uh, Lucas, welcome. Um, back to Robinson per Zoom, but welcome back, and uh, we're just so proud of you. Um, you know, tell me a little bit about. First of all, we haven't really had this video with you and, and a chance to interview you, Sue, so since you graduated in 2013. It's been a whirlwind, but tell us a little bit about you and what's been going on. Yeah, so um, so I graduated in Robinson in 2013. I went to North Carolina State University where I competed on their rifle team. Yep, go pack. And um, while I was there, uh, I studied sport management and I got a um, bachelor of science in sport management with a minor in leadership. Um, I was a two-time, or it's weird. It's like I was all American my junior and senior year in three different categories. Um, I was an NCAA contender um, twice. I was an NCAA finalist once. And I went to the Olympics the first time in Rio. Um, and then after I graduated in 2017, um, my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, Blair Grundle, we basically have like a week after we graduated, I mean, we were packing up and we moved out here to Colorado and we got an apartment. Um, and we've been out here for about four years. And so I've been training at the training center. I've competed in world championships. I went to the Pan American games where I, won gold and in the individual 10 meter event and where I got silver with Mindy Miles in the mixed team um, air gun event uh, with a kidney infection. That was kind of like my little claim to fame because I was in the hospital two days before my event and that was that was not a not a good time. Um, and then since then uh, when, when made the Olympic team for this time around and then COVID happened. So, you know, fast forward a year. Um, Went to a couple of World Cups earlier in the spring where I won World Cup New Delhi. Um, we got bronze in the mixed team event. And then I went to Croatia where I did okay. And then in the individual side of things, then we've got um, fourth in Croatia. And then we just went to the Olympics. I finished sixth in the individual side of things. And then Mary Tucker and I got silver in the team event. And now I'm here on this, on this Zoom call. Man, that, that is so awesome. And um... You know, as an athlete and as a coach, I've, I've gotten to see the world, but not quite probably through the view and through the lens that you have. You've gotten to see the world as an athlete, as a top level, top of the world, Olympic silver medalist. Is it is it a great way to see the world? Do you get to enjoy it? Um, You know, it's, it's different. Um, I think a lot of it is very like I want to go and travel like recreationally. You know, like go on vacation for once, but just about everywhere we go, it's like, I've got my guns and I've got my gear bag and we, we got to be here this time doing this thing. And we got to be training, eating right. Um, and so there's been a few takes where it's like, Hey, let's go see the great wall of China, or we're going to go do this somewhere else. And, um, you know, we've had some glimpses where it's been cool, but it's more of like, I've got this like list of things that I should probably go back and see at some point once I have more time. <laughs> but right now it's mostly just business, go out there, represent the country kind of thing. Absolutely. So you moved here in ninth grade. Had you um, been involved in shooting and in rifle before? No. Came to Robinson. Okay. So tell me a little bit about the process. How do you get involved in the sport uh, when you, when you're here starting, you know, as a, as a 15 year old? Yeah. So I saw it through the morning announcements my freshman year, I was sitting in, um, in history at 8 a.m., you know, just kind of sitting there looking up at the, the thing. And I saw it roll across like for three days straight. And it just kind of occurred to me. It's like, you know, I could go do that probably. And so I went to, I went to the interest meeting, but really I showed up late because I was taking a, uh, a biology test. And um, the, the coach that was giving the, the, the intro meeting, I showed up and I was late and he scolded me and, you know, gave me a lecture about, um, you know, being on time, respecting things, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like moving, moving to the back of the room. And this is in the health class down there by the, like by the gymnasium. So you know how long it is and yeah. you know, either the front, I'm trying to get all the way to the back. And so it was like this, this targeted, like you're, you, you specifically are, are, are feeling this. So 
I, I was actually really inspired by that because I was just totally very colorfully put in my place and like, this is going to be cool. So I told my parents about it and my dad and I went over to the, to the NRA um, at 6 a.m. And we, um, we just did the safety briefings for three weeks straight. And next thing we know, we're sitting there buying equipment. We had like this little like yard sale kind of thing where a lot of people were selling used stuff. There was some new stuff available. And so we were like, yeah, we're just going to, we're just going to go for it. Um, I'm not sure who, who is in charge of it right now, but I believe, um, I, I was on the team with coach Hardy and coach Cunningham. Right. And those were my guys for, for my four years when I was at Robinson. Well, Coach Hardy was here as the coach when I was in high school. And uh, he just, obviously, you know, he just recently passed. Yeah. His son, Rob, wrestled with, uh, before me, but before me at Robinson and before me at George Mason. So I've known the family for a long time. And, man, he, he, he was not afraid to talk, but he was a knowledgeable man. And Coach Cunningham oh, uh, continued the program, and then, he, and then they just brought a new coach in. I uh, believe last year, but um, so, so you start in ninth grade and, and did you have immediate success? Uh, tell me, tell me about the kind of the path here and then deciding to go down to North Carolina state to compete. How, how does that work? Yeah. So um, the way that somebody could get an athletic letter in, in rifle at Robinson um, was out of a, a 300, shot score so it's 10 10 rounds in each position and so the, the high school league uses this as their course of fire um and you needed a 250 at the time to to letter and up until the day of the winter sports banquet i hadn't shot that score and i shot it that day and so the coach is like yep we're throwing you in there and so i got i i got my letter the last day that i could my freshman year of high school and that um so if that, if that tells you anything, I was really not that great. Um, but between the, the summer of my freshman and sophomore year, my, my dad got deployed to Japan. And, um, you know, we kind of sat around and talked about it. I was like, do you, do you guys want to keep pursuing this? And I was like, yeah, I, I, I do. Because it's, it's fun. I'm having a great time. And so we ended up buying like a better suit, a little bit better equipment. Um, and then things just started kind of coming together and clicking. And I started learning more about the sport. Um, and North Carolina state really came into the picture. My, my junior year, uh, where I was shooting a local match and one of the, uh, one of the families from one of the rival clubs in the area. said, Hey, have you ever thought about North Carolina state? I was like, well, no, nah, not really. I haven't even thought about college. And so I emailed them first. Um, and I kind of went on this whirlwind of other schools and looking around, but um, NC state wanted me and I saw a lot of potential there. And so I decided to head on down there and, and become a member of the Wolfpack. That's fantastic. And, and so, uh, 2015 happens and you obviously had to qualify for the Olympic trials and then you make the team, um, which, you know, you're well known here in the school as, as, one of our first Olympians uh, between Rob Musio and, yeah. and a couple of our other track folks, we've had a few Olympians, uh, but you know, you, you're, you're up there. Tell me about that experience. And then if you can um, link it to this last one. And, and obviously you come back and you're, you're a medalist this time. Tell me, tell me about the difference between the two events. Yeah. So my, my journey to the, to the Rio Olympics, um, started, I think the summer of 2015, um, I had a pretty poor year in, in college. Well, I mean, it was fine objectively, but I, I wanted more for myself. And so I really started looking at different ways to train and to, and to commit to the sport. Um, and at the same time, I became precancerous with melanoma. And so I had some molds removed. They were all benign, but I was like, okay, so I've got these, this, this huge long incision in my back and I can't really, I can't train. I can't work out or anything. So I decided to work on mental management and I, I did a lot of studying, um, come around to fall semester. It occurred to me, it's like, I'm a junior in college. I've got two years left. I, I need to make the most of this time. And it was literally one match after another, um, I was pouring my soul out there, but it wasn't just me. My, my, the team, the, the Wolfpack, we collectively started shooting a lot better. And so we were breaking school records. We were pushing boundaries. Uh, we all of a sudden we went from, you know, not really a relevant program to contenders in the NCAA in a couple of weeks. And 
we we took the the whole thing by storm. We showed up to win an air gun, which was the first part of Olympic trials. And I was really out there just to prove something and it'd be like, you know, I'm, I'm the guy from NC state, you know, leading the program. <clears throat> and I made every final, made every open final and every junior final. And I won every junior final. I got eighth in the first open final third in the second. And then I won the last one. And I ended up putting myself in, in contention for the Olympic team slot. And so I asked the national coach, I'm like, okay, so what, what's the deal? Like, what do I need to do from here? And he goes, well, we need to get you an MQS, which is the minimum qualifying score just to go to the Olympics. I didn't have that in air gun. I got it in small board the year before, but I didn't have that for air gun. So that meant I had to go to Thailand in the middle of our season. And so what ended up happening was NC state at the time was a part of two collegiate conferences. And the first one, the great American rifle conference, we had our championships where we got third. I finished in the final and fourth, and that was probably our best finish in the, in the conference ever. And the next day, Keith Miller, the coach and I, we got on a plane in Memphis. We flew all the way to Thailand, Bangkok, Thailand. The next day I shot my match. I got on the plane that night, flew all the way to Charleston, South Carolina to shoot the Southeastern Air Rifle Championship, where the next day I got up, shot my qualification score and won the final. Then three days later, we find ourselves in Ohio going to NCAAs. And that's where I shot the, um, the I tied the school record at the time and I got fifth, fifth in the final um, after being halfway around the world and back in about two weeks. And so it was, it was kind of a whirlwind, like, yeah, this is me and me doing my thing. And then I, then I was able with all of this, I went to Olympic trials in June where it was kind of the same thing. It's like, I'm out here going to prove myself. And I had the high qualification the first day I finished in the final and third and I got more points for that. And I didn't look back. I was on the team in the middle of the match on the third day, right after qualification, I got congratulations from the CEO, from the national coach or high performance director that said, congratulations, you are mathematically on the team. Um, we got to get you squared away. And at that point, you know, Rio at that time didn't really mean like the Olympics to me. It was more of like, I'm here to prove myself. And then I proved it at trials. And so fast forward to the Olympics, there I am. And I'm like, I did not prepare for this at all. You know, I'm, I'm like, not, not even, <laughs> not even ready for this. And so I did okay. Um, but it was definitely motivating. Like by the time I, I finished my match and I looked up at the screen, like, yeah, I'm in 22nd place. I'm going to go to Tokyo. I, and I, I made that decision by the time I made it back to like walk around to go see my family after the match. Um, and so these last five years has been far more targeted towards like the Olympics and what the Olympics mean, that individual pursuit and taking care of like mind, body, and soul things like more work now, more physical therapy, equipment stuff, um, just getting smarter with things. And along the way, you know, I've won a bunch of stuff. I've lost a, a, lost a lot more and, um, you know, suffered a great much, but at the same time, it's been really fulfilling journey. And when I got to Tokyo, like, yeah, there's stress and there's anxiety and there's a lot of pressure, but it really became more of like, this is, this is the accumulation of what I've been doing for the last five years. And I'm just going to go out there and be the athlete that I designed myself to be. And that is somebody who's, you know, focused around being okay with the system that I made. And when I went out and shot the match, I was second in qualifying in the individual side of things. I got six in the final and um, I made a point of this because I was re I am really happy with how I finished in the individual side of things. I turn around when I, you know, they make us walk out, walk away from the final one at a time. And leaving sixth place, I made I made a point to smile and wave to everybody because like, you know what, I am good at this. I, I threw up a good fight and it was a hard final and it was a good time. On the other side of things, Mary Tucker and I, we both finished in sixth in the individual side of things. I shot one tenth better than her in qualification. She would she also got second overall in her in her um, qualification. And so we were out for blood. It's like we are going to go and prove something today. And that's what we did. And we just poured our souls out there. Like the qualification was turbulent at, at best, but we, we did the job and we made it to the gold medal round where we threw our, threw our hearts out there and we were only shy just by a few points. And so it was, it was a good time. It was a fulfilling time. And I got to walk away with a little bit of hardware. Uh, you don't happen to have it right there with you, do you? I do actually. Yeah. I figured it. Show it, <laughs> show it to us. That's amazing. It, uh, uh, it's just so beautiful. And, uh, and man, I just, 
I, I'm so in awe of of your story and and you know the fact that that uh, you married a Robinson Ram, you're a Robinson Ram, and and so so really besides rifle uh, that you had starting your freshman year, um, tell me a little bit more about your experience here and and um, you know I'm I'm an individual coach right I'm a wrestling coach and so I understand the kind of the mindset of that but but tell me about your experience at Robinson. Um, my I guess my freshman and sophomore year I was really just big into shooting stuff. Um, and when I, when I was a junior, I signed on and did the, uh, Air Force Air TC program. And so that was something I was kind of dabbling with was the, the military stuff. Um, and so when I was pursuing, um, what college options I wanted to look at, the Naval Academy was really big for me. Um, but for, for medical reasons, I was disqualified. And so that kind of put me on the path towards, um, towards NC State, um, so, but while I was there at Robinson, I was really big with, um, well, I mean, that was pretty much it, actually. I was, I was uh, Mrs. Higginbotham's um, student aide my senior year. And so that was, that was a good, that was a good year to spend with her. Yeah, sure. um, doing best. Note running and everything like that. I mean, we even just hung out and sat there and talked all the time. I mean, that was, that was great. Phenomenal. And so um, you met your wife here at Robinson did. Or did you, did, were you, you know, were you dating her here or did you figure all that dating thing out later? Yeah, we, we started dating sophomore year. Um, we had the same history class with uh, uh, Miss Laudermilk. Um, and so we were just kind of hanging out. And as time went on, we kind of started looking at, at colleges and looking at things. And it's like, do you want to try the long distance thing? And we're like, yeah, sure. And we were only, I mean, she went to Mary Washington. And so that was only about four hours away from where I was. And so as, as we kind of progressed through college, we, like, we found time for each other. And then junior and senior year, we really spent a lot of time at each other's schools um, in our free time. Or like when I was in the off season in the spring, I, I would make time to go up there. Um, and that's pretty much what we did. And then when it, when it came around to graduating, um, this has already been almost a year after the Olympics. I got a, I got a phone call from the national team saying, hey, do you want to be part of the resident athlete program and I asked her like do I have to live there like can I live in town and they said yeah that's your choice and so I asked her if she wanted to take a chance on going to Colorado and um what ended up happening was I we both graduated I flew to Germany to go shoot a world cup she was moving out of her school and when I flew back I the next day literally I threw my 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 jeep full of stuff and I drove up to Virginia. My dad flew in. We got a trailer. We went to her house. We threw all of our stuff into the trailer. And we were gone the next day, headed, headed west. And so that was that was kind of where, where things were. And then after a couple months living here, we got an apartment north of town. And then um, after a couple months, um, I proposed to her. And then in October of 18, we got married in, in uh, Chantilly. Okay. Or in Centerville, sorry. That's... that's um a fantastic Robinson, you know, love affair. And, and, uh, you know, you have that to, to fall back on. Um, so being on the world-class athlete program in, in, in the, in the high performance area and living in Colorado Springs, how has that raised your level being around it every day and being a part of, of, you know, the program in Colorado Springs? Cause I mean, what a beautiful place to live first of all, but also, you're at the Olympic Training Center. So so tell me a little bit about that. Um, so it's been, the environment's really good. Like the altitude is, is helpful. Um, you know, it's dry. And so we actually get a little bit of benefit with, with the equipment and how it performs, like the guns and the suits and everything. Um, but actually, so one of the things that did happen when I moved out here was that the resident program was actually cut right at the end of 2017. And it wasn't just for us. It was for a bunch of sports out here. And so... Um, what I ended up doing, cause all of a sudden I lost some funding and I lost some support. Um, I ended up starting a business called team winning solutions. And so what I was able to do, um, well, I guess there was two things that really happened. I, I started mentoring and working with kids across the country, just online remotely and in person. Um, but at the same time, I was able to kind of start culture building for like kind of what I felt like was the high performing side of things. And that was helpful internally with me. Um, and that allowed me to 
kind of create this sphere of influence inside of, um, you know, what I needed to do to be high performing. And then when I would go to the range and be with my peers, I mean, there's people in the army, there's people who had sponsors and other stuff, um, or the people coming in for training camps. And so it was, it was a very, you know, competitive environment for the last few years. Um, and so that's kind of what, what it was. Everybody brought stuff to the table and it's an individual sport. And so as far as like what I do versus somebody else, it doesn't really impact anybody, but when there's this, this fear of, um, of effort and focus, that is kind of what, what was really tuned in at the same time, there's a lot of resources at the USOPC that we were able to take, you know, able to use like nutrition and, and sports psych. And there's a lot of different things with, with your brain and exercise. And so really for the last four years, I've been, I've been studying because we just never did that in college. It was more of, you know, here's what you need to do. Here's the hours required to work. Here's your workout schedule. And it was good because it taught me discipline and how to be a competitor. Um, but when I went to the Olympic training center, it was more of, we're looking under every rock and we're going to turn every stone and we're going to figure out what makes you click. And in around 2019, I really started putting together this, this firm system in the beginning of the year, uh, went to Beijing and finished uh, 16th. And that was a big plus for me. Um, and then I went to Pan Am's one Pan Am's. And after that point, it was just, we're going for it. And I've been using that for the last two years. So I, I, I'm a, I'm a Olympic file and I know that, you have to qualify through whether it be the world championships or whether it be the Pan Ams, or sometimes there's like a last chance qualifier, I think. Yeah. So you qualified your event through the Pan Ams. Is that correct? Or did you qualify through the world championships um, in 2020, 19? So I, I earned a quota in 2019, but the way, that we decided to allocate the quotas was actually based off of a pure trial system in the United States. And so what, what this means is all of us went out overseas and we got a bunch of quotas and whatever, but they weren't our quotas. They were for the country. And so I got my quote in July of 2019. And then I turned around in uh, December and I started Olympic trials part one to earn it. And so um, that's kind of how that worked. Um, and each quad is a little bit different because there's usually like some kind of theme or some, you know, internal stuff that drives like how that works. Um, and it's depending on the sport too. Um, cause I, I believe like sports, like swimming and track and field, it's pretty, pretty objective. Like just here, here's all the spots and you're going to go and do the thing. Um, and for, for shooting domestically here, we, we've got a pretty competitive team. And so, um, it, it made a lot of sense at the time to do a trial system. Um, we did that last time as well. And so we actually, we, we got one of the up and comers, Ginny Thrasher, and she ended up earning a goal. She's from uh, West Springfield. Um, and so she, um, she, she was able to do that. So that's how we've been running our trials and, and how we made the team. And so I started in 2019. We fit, we had a second half in February of 2020. And um, I've been on, the, I was on the team from, February of 2020 up until last week. And so we knew pretty early um, that we were on a team relative to other sports, like, you know, gymnastics and some of these other, other teams pick fairly close to the games. We, we picked ours far, far out. Awesome. So I'm, I'm jumping kind of back and forth on some questions here, but uh, for Robinson students mm -hmm. who are considering rifle or basketball or wrestling or lacrosse or, whatever it might be, what's, what do you, you're, you're the best of the best right now, right? What are, what's some advice that you have for them and, and your high performance. So talk to me, your advice for a kid who's interested in, in, in high performance. You know, the, the biggest thing is, well, there's two pieces. Um, and the thing is, is that it's probably not much different than what a lot of high school and, you know, club coaches say, but kids don't really seem to resonate with this is you got to give it time. Like it, it takes a genuine amount of time to do the craft. I mean, if you play any of these skill sports that require technique, like, okay, golf, bowling, um, whatever, there needs to be time around and studying of the movements and everything, whether it's wrestling, football, basketball, soccer that require a lot of physical conditioning, there, there has to be time behind it. And so, 
Um, the big piece that that comes with that is, well, when when kids are in high school, they've got a lot of, like every, these kids have a lot going on. They've got, you know, their their high school stuff. A lot of them are doing AP um, IB stuff, um, trying to figure out what they're going to do for the rest of their lives. Um, but when when we're talking about sports in that in that critical high school time frame, um, it's it, it requires time and it doesn't need to be like an intense like this is my entire life kind of time. It's more of it's it's understanding and this goes into my second point of just learning the skill and the sport that's required to do well um have that understanding so you just spend the time well it doesn't there's no correlation between how much you work out and how much you perform because there, there needs to be rest in there there needs to be recovery you, you got to eat you got to sleep you got to have balance um emotionally you got to be happy and enjoying it and so there's got to be balance with this whole thing too and that comes through understanding and so um, when I'm talking to a lot of these high school kids, and I work with a lot of high school kids too, um, the biggest thing that I promote is just study the craft. Um, Bruce Lee has this quote out there, and I'm going to butcher it, but the basic premise is the true masters don't really care what the outcome is. They're there trying to make sure that they're the best at the craft. And there, there, is, a, there is a difference there. The best fundamental athletes in the world are usually the most consistent winners. I mean, look at Tom Brady. There's, there's no, I mean, that's not a, a fluke. I mean, that guy is the best quarterback of all time. And you see that through leadership. You see that through how he's, you know, calling plays, whatever. Um, he just understands the sport and himself really well. And he's had a prolonged career and a really good one. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what I want to, want to tell kids. And that's what I do tell kids a lot is, and you got to take time with it and you got to study and be okay with whatever is, is going to happen. I mean, I lost a lot of matches. Um, when I was coming up through the Olympics the first time, when I made the team, um, I wasn't even, I wasn't even listed in the article explaining what the event was. I was, I, my name wasn't even up there. Um, let, a, let alone being a favorite or somebody who's even a contender. And that's just because my, my junior athletic career was really subpar. I really didn't start blossoming until I got to college. Um, and even then it was kind of mediocre. Um, and so it takes time. It takes a lot of time. And there's that rule of thumb of like, you know, 10,000 hours or a hundred thousand reps, give or take. I mean, that's, that's pretty true. Um, and when you look at the scope of things like 10,000 hours of just sport related stuff. I mean, that's a long time. That's, that's well beyond anybody can do in high school or middle school, or even before then it's, and it's, and it's okay to pursue this stuff in college as a club or um, as an adult, as a hobby, if you enjoy it. And there's been a lot of stories about people who, you know, in their mid twenties, who didn't do anything in college, who do end up on the world cup circuit or in the Olympics or whatever. And so that's, entirely that person's timeline that's that's their choice so cool oh man i'm uh, i'm so in awe and obviously you've gotten to where you are it, it, the physical piece the mental piece the emotional piece uh you have sounds like you have great balance in your life you did talk about the enjoyment piece and i'm jumping back to 2016 and 2021 here uh the games um did you guys get to stay in the village? Tell me about, tell me about the, the Olympic experience. Yeah. Uh, you know, not just you, you've made the team, you compete for the team, but obviously being a part of team USA has a, an aura, an amazing experience. Talk to me about that. You know, it, it is, um, each Olympics is different, but so in Rio, we got to, you know, we stayed at the village both times in Rio. We got to go and watch other sports. We got to um, interact with other people, whatever. Um, we got to explore Rio, and that was really cool. Rio is a pretty beautiful city at night, um, and that was and that was just perspective changing. I mean, that was that was really cool. It's like here we are at the Olympics, and we get to see and meet and interact with all these all these great people. Um, this time around, it was a little bit different. We stayed at the village, um, but we're really confined to our to our teams. And so the shooting sports really hung out together. Um, 
and like we were all interacting with one another at the dining hall that's that's probably the safest place to be though right the shooting the uh you know people don't really come into the shooting place because they know that you all carry weapons oh yeah well i mean we are in to tokyo japan which was crazy to me because it was like it was so clean and it took us a while to get there but it's like man we're traveling a huge distance but i mean we're we're zooming on the highway and then we googled it i'm like and tokyo is the biggest city in the world and you think about it, it's like there's 15 million people here and it is incredibly clean. It's the only thing that we really noticed was that it was bright at night. There's so much light pollution. that when we looked outside, it's like you can't see the dark, the night sky. You can see the moon, but you can't really see the stars. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, I'm sorry. I cut you, off. you said you got to eat in the dining hall with everybody. That was one thing. So I'm sorry. Yeah. I cut you off. Well, it was kind of weird, too, because we had like these cubicles with like these, this clear glass and we'd have to like yell at each other through, through this stuff. Um, and yeah, I mean, I was, that was pretty much, pretty much it, but it, it was, it was weird though. Cause like, yeah, we're restricted to our teams, but, um, and I, and we weren't the only sport that kind of felt like this. It's like, there's a lot of camaraderie building internally. Cause it's like, well, I mean, we're here X many days before our match. We can't, we can't really go out and do anything. So we just hung out and we're around each other. And it was a good, it was a good team. The shooting, the USA shooting had our best quad in a very long time. Um, and everyone was just enjoying the interactions and everything like that. And so um, I guess the first Olympics for me was really like, let's go out and experience what like the Olympics is. And the second one around is like really experiencing what team USA is about. And so that was, that was really cool. Um, and I had a great time. Amazing. Um... I looked for you, did it, but I didn't see you. Did you get to walk in either opening ceremony? I did in both. Um, this time around, because I stayed for the whole ceremony the, the, the in Rio, and we ended up getting back to the village at like two in the morning. Um, and so I was like, well, I want to walk. And then I was going to head back to the room. And so I ended up getting back just a little bit before midnight. Um, but those both of those were just kind of surreal events where it's, where it's come in and um, – you know, th this is the beginning of the Olympics and you have all these nations coming together to, you know, throw hands and compete. Um, and it was, it was really just a really cool thing. The, the stark contrast between the two was when we were in Rio, I mean, there was a, like, I think it was like 40,000 people or something. Like it was just absurd just how big the stadium was. And in Tokyo, it was absolutely empty. And so we were very quiet. And so there is, there is a very weird energy with that one, because the first one's like, oh, loud, we're team, team USA, we're screaming and chanting and, you know, running around and stuff. And we rolled into the Tokyo opening ceremony. And it was very much the opposite. It was very calm and tame and controlled, um, but kind of fitting for the circumstances with, with, with COVID and um, the culture there of respect. And so it was very, it was very unique and different. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it was just, pretty pretty surreal so surreal but also what an honor to to be a part of that and and what an um, um, unbelievable incredible accomplishment for you um so going back high school time you've talked to us a little bit about you know how to get started um you talked about your experience here do you, do you have anything else for us? This is our 50th anniversary of Robinson this year, which is a, a pretty cool, uh, you know, a, a different type of thing. Um, do you have anything else for us in yeah. whether it be college, high school, anything, shooting? You know, so, and what what is there, like 4,500 students now at Robinson? A little bit less than that, but, but we're, you know, we're about 4,000. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people there and something that, that I kind of felt like, like, and, and occasionally that I kind of, kind of went through when I was going through was kind of feeling like I was a little bit like alone and lost. And I didn't have like that kind of coverage. And, but part of like most of that really was just me not reaching out and asking questions. Like when I became a senior in high school, I, I was, you know, in the upper part of the ROTC program, I got involved with the sub school 11 people with uh, principal, Rid um, uh, principal Riddle and Mrs. Higginbotham and I got to start interacting with all these people and I'm sitting there and there's perspective there. There's life advice. There's a lot of things that I learned from the staff and I really want to encourage all these kids here. Um, 
go talk to people. I mean, that's why they're here. They're here to guide you through life. And it's more than just the subjects or more than just the sports. I mean, there's everyone's got complicated backgrounds. Everyone's got things going on. Uh, who cares? Like, just go talk to people, make time for it, stay after school, whatever, get involved with the club. Um, it's, it's a big deal. And when, and when I went to college, I didn't realize this is like life hits you in the face and you got to get going. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to have some skills in a support structure, but, you know, for everyone that's there right now, take the time, make relationships with your teachers, um, ask them questions. And that becomes a really important network later in life when you come back, whether to visit or even if you're just having a hard time in college or later, it's like, these are, these are people who are here to help you. Um, you know, specifically the career center, please. I did not use that nearly enough. Um, cause if I did, I probably would have applied to another dozen colleges and, you know, maybe my career would be totally different instead of wearing red, I probably would have wore blue, you know, I have no idea. Um, so it's, it's, it, that's, that's really what I want to throw out there to all you kids is really get to know your teachers interact with them, get on the same page, ask them questions, share your dreams with them. Because a lot of them would, you know, would share in those aspirations, have, you know, tips and tools on how to get there, whatever. It might even change what classes you take the next year. So ask questions and, and really get involved. Great advice. Uh, we, we, I was just at a uh, administrative summit and, you know, very much similar to, to what we talked about. Sometimes it's not the, the X's and O's or the ones plus twos. It's to those relationships that you're building. And, uh, you said you might've, you know, you, instead of wearing red, you could have worn blue, but you know, the coolest part is that you got to wear the red, white, and blue. You yeah. got to, you got, you got to represent in, in my opinion, and hopefully everybody who's watching this, the greatest country in the world. And, uh, we are, blessed and happy that you get to, you know, we get to say that you're an alumni here and that, you know, you're a part of our, our world and, and being a Ram. Where can we follow you? What, you know, what's next for you? So I am headed to USA shooting nationals in October, and then we are starting the next quad. Well, I'm not really starting. We've already started the next quad. And so I'm going to be going to Europe for a world cup final. Um, it says Azerbaijan, but I think they're looking at changing the venue just to, because of scheduling and whatever. Um, so I'm going to be somewhere in Europe shooting the, the Champions League match. Um, and so, I mean, if you guys want to follow me on Instagram at Lucas Cause USA, Lucas K-O-Z in the middle, USA, I mean, feel free to, to, to tag along. Um, as, also, I'll, t- I'll take a second to do this. There's that mural of me in the front. I did sign it a couple years ago. So go ahead and go look for the signature and maybe you can take a picture and send that to me because I always find that to be pretty funny. That's so. Awesome. Because Mr. Gompers was there and he let me do it. So sorry, Mr. Gompers. <laughs> no, hey, uh, we, that's, you know, we, Chell Lindgren came back, the astronaut. He signed his. We hope Jill Ellis and, and uh, Sean Camp and, and Javier uh, and, and, um, and, our, and our ambassador will, uh, will come back and do that as well. Um, Lucas, I, I, I want to thank you for, for coming in and, and, you know, and, and popping on and talking to us. And, you know, we need, we need you to be, uh, a legacy. Obviously, you have it because you have the picture on the wall. But we, you know, we want to get you back here and and uh, and influence um, our community because you're you are um, the epitome of success. And so we just we thank you so much. And uh, you know, um, we we hope that uh, that we get to see you soon. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to come back. I love to talk to everybody. I always kind of had a dream about sitting in the auditorium like Mr. Myers used to do and just sit there and scream at all, all six grades, you know, like maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll just walk in during the next pep rally if I figure out when that is. So and I have a, I have a mic. You, you can come in anytime. So if you're back in uh, September 24th is, uh, is homecoming and we're going to do our 50 year celebration. So, you know, you come to the football game, we'll put you out in the center with, you can scream at the, all the, all the cheering fans. Cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Right. Awesome. Uh, with that, everybody, Lucas Kaczynski, uh, you at Team USA, uh, Robinson Ram, and we're so lucky to have you. So thanks again, Lucas. Thank you.